When I started working with Secor as a research scientist on Curacao, Ellie was hired a bit later. Between the restoration technician that she is, she can really help me apply the work on larger scales and I am more focused on the research part. We really contribute to the both aspects of the work. And now we really form a team. The knowledge that we currently have uh, to be able to predict coral spawning is based on about uh, the last 15 to 20 years of research. The most important part is the sea surface temperature. Then the second thing they base their spawning uh, times on is the lunar cycle, so the moon phase. So most species spawn a certain days after full moon. Most coral species will actually spawn on that same day within like an hour time frame and it's always pretty accurate. So even if we have very predictable uh, tables to know when we enter the water and go collect spawn, we kind of have the intuition when we get in the water if it's going to happen or not. One of the best examples is the brain coral species which is spawning during the day because it's releasing uh, gametes in daytime. A lot of fish are um, attracted to the coral colonies that are about to spawn. So we can actually follow them in the water column and go find the next colony that will be spawning. For other species, you also, the moment you put your head on the water, you hear, you hear so much activity on the water, the snapping shrimps, Every single fish is out in the water column, invertebrates. So you kind of already know that it's going to be happening. Every time I witness coral spawning, I keep being impressed on how nature can First of all, coordinate you know, the timing that all these colonies will reproduce at the same time is phenomenal. It never ceases to amaze every time you're underwater. It never gets old. Um, very often we're actually diving for a few days already before it actually happens. So you're, it's the, like the tension is building up and then once it finally happens every time, you're like, wow, it's, it, it's really, really great. It, it's beautiful. The biology about it all, is, it, it's amazing. Colleagues have been in the news more and more often, sadly, because they're not doing well. Um, after what happened to the Great Barrier Reef uh, the last few years, I think more, more people are aware of the situation of the decline of coral reefs. But to me, it doesn't make the work harder. It makes, me, it makes me look better for examples of reefs that are rebounding, that are actually doing better in these circumstances. Coral populations that are able to withstand the current conditions are where we should start looking to find, you know, what, it, what is it that they're doing differently? Why are they surviving all of the other ones aren't? I think we can learn a ton by focusing on corals that are actually doing well with the conditions of today. Especially for restoration, it's a good starting point to investigate corals that are great for this century. Curacao actually has a little bit of everything, which is why it's so great to work here. We have a couple of very, very highly degraded reefs or algae dominated reefs. Those are reefs where there used to be a really high coral cover, but by now it's algae dominated. There's hardly any structure left. There's hardly any grazers left, hardly any fish. You see trash underwater everywhere. But opposite to that, we also have like um, a couple of reefs here that are actually rated as the most pristine reefs of the Caribbean. It's so cool to see how well those reefs are doing. Reefs are degrading as a whole, not just the corals are disappearing, but also a great amount of important grazers are disappearing. We are losing a great amount of our parrotfish, which are very responsible for grazing away the algae. 
And in the early 80s, we lost um, the long-spined urchin, which is the diadema antelarum. Those were thought to be the most important grazers in the Caribbean. And after they disappeared, they virtually disappeared from all the reefs in the Caribbean, the algal cover in the Caribbean started going up greatly. So we would also need to bring back grazers to eliminate the algae if we want to start thinking about actual reef restoration. Well, Seco's work really focuses on coral reproduction. And what's really special about this technique is the fact that every time we work with new corals, they're all genetically different. So every time we cross different parents together, we get what we call gene recombinations. Every single coral larvae in our culture harbors different genes or carries different genes. Well, by having a very large pool of different genes, we might be lucky enough to have several individuals in there that are better fit, that are better equipped to cope with today's conditions on coral reefs. So that's really the idea behind the work with uh, CCOR, is, is to at least maintain our enhanced genetic diversity to help those populations to be better prepared for the future. So I like to think about coral restoration as one tool in the toolbox. And the uh, other tools in that toolbox would be, for example, coastal management, uh, protection of our grazing fishes, so through fishing quotas, uh, but also maintaining our water quality. So all of these regulations need to be in place for us to be able to uh, succeed with coral reef restoration. If the reef is already in, a, in bad shape because there's none of these enforcements taking place already, and if they make those decisions, then that sets the stage for coral reef restoration. It will be very difficult to bring corals back on a reef where corals are already dying. Coral reef restoration uh, should only be applied as one extra approach that we can take to increase coral cover in those populations. Over the past few years, Seacor has been hosting two workshops per year. We get people actually from all over the world that want to learn about coral spawning and they want to see the whole process through to outplanting. They learn with us in the lab, they attend lectures. We walk them through the process of pretty much doing larval propagation for reef restoration. It's always a lot of fun as people are coming here that are very serious about starting to implement this work at their home stations. The techniques used by CCOR using the reproductions or the sexual reproduction approach is not so common. So there's a lot of training to be done. You know, it's a, a field where you really have to start from A to Z and train very carefully at every step. What we think is very important to start training many potential new partners or new collaborators that could start implementing this kind of work throughout the Caribbean. We are still fine-tuning some of the techniques, but the moment everything is optimal or you know, at, at its best, we will have hopefully an army of people ready to apply the techniques all over the world. Mm -hmm.